Hello and welcome to the Sight and Sound video history series of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. I'm Tom Walton. One of the joys of hosting Sight and Sound is the opportunity and privilege to sit down and talk to people I've admired for a long time and our guest today is certainly on that list. Stan Odeski's record of service to his community is an impressive one. He's best known probably as the region's preeminent political forecaster, pollster, and a man to whom many public agencies and candidates have turned over the years for advice and counsel and forecasts. And Stan, it's a pleasure to be with you. We have a number of mutual interests, uh, so I'm we looking very do. much forward to our conversation. <laughs> Same here. You spent your career in a line of work that I always have found fascinating uh, as a journalist. And we'll get to that in just a little bit, but I want to start out with some biographical information, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, let's talk first about your early years. And if I have this uh, research correct, you were a Yankee Doodle Dandy, born Absolutely. on the 4th of July in 1937, is yeah. that right? Not only that, I came out two months early to make sure I would hit the 4th. Well, <laughs> so perhaps, that, <laughs> perhaps that explains your natural affinity for political endeavors and so forth. And Never uh, thought of it that way, but that's yeah. possible. <laughs> I didn't know until recently that your first name, your first full name was Stanford, right. not Stanley. Uh, what was the significance of Stanford to your parents? Well, a actually, uh, well, she, she didn't want the Stanley because she didn't want Stanislaus. Um, so, and then in the fourth grade, uh, there was another student, Stanford, and me, Stan Ling and Stan Odesky. We flipped the coin, so I became Stan, and he held on to Stanford. So that was the angle on how we got to where we are. But there was no uh, relationship no. to forebearers or anything? Oh, oh yeah. In, in all cases in the Jewish religion, you, you're named okay. after. So this, right. I'm named after my grandfather's brother. Okay. Now, you or, mentioned uh, your grandfather. You have a Russian heritage we should talk about a little bit. Your paternal grandparents, right. uh, Henry and Ida Odesky, I Henry believe were their Ida names, Odesky were born Kurt. in the 1860s in Russia. Uh, why did they emigrate to America? Oh, I, I think uh, in the early 1900s when they emigrated, both grandparents, by mm -hmm. the way, at that time, it was a situation of uh, the economy uh, hassling uh, the Jewish population uh, in some of the small pogroms mm -hmm. that were going on and just an opportunity for a better life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I never really got in direct conversation on that with my grandparents, but I've done an awful lot of uh, research, genealogical research, and... For instance, I found that my grandparents on my mother's side that came from Lithuania um, lived around the corner from each other there. My grandfather went to Boston. My grandmother came over here as a sewer in a furrier uh, job. And then he was on his way to the West Coast to open up a shoe store, stopped here to see Mamie, and stayed, and they got married. Mm -hmm. So that situation was here. You can take it a step further. It's interesting. Again, here in the local history department, I came across the fact that both grandparents were naturalized at the same day. And they really? didn't know each other, both grandfathers. They didn't know each other at the time until my father and mother started going together many years later. One was in the Woodward side of the world on the other side of Franklin. One of, Jerry, clearly one of the advantages <laughs> of having a researcher in the family is you can trace that family tree, yes. you know, where to look and where yeah, to go, yeah. including the public library. Uh, they did live long enough for you to know them? Yes. Uh, uh, not my grandmother on my father's side. Mm -hmm. Ida passed away in 1937 before I was born uh, visiting uh, in Indianapolis where a couple of her girls uh, went. There were eight kids, mm -hmm. uh, six stayed here, four boys and two of the gals, wow. and two went to Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Now, your father was uh, Irving, is that right? Irving Odesky. Your mother, Marion. Right. Uh, what are your fond fondest memories well, one parents? thing you're going to find is nobody will know my dad is Irving. His nickname was Butch. Yeah. And he, uh, I, I think it was uh, their support to both me and my brother growing up from a, uh, a timing. We both got involved in athletics, my brother better than me, mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. But um, while my, my dad started out uh, working at the Blade, for many, many years and worked with the downtown newspaper boys mm -hmm. on distribution. And he opened up a little store at the bottom of the stairs when you go into the Blade Building, uh, coming in from the uh, city office building side. And then he started a store over on Cherry Street mm -hmm. at 2222 Cherry, across from St. Vincent's. Yeah. 
he worked there literally full time. My mother used to go in to help out at uh, lunchtime so he could go out and then uh, go out on his purchases. And uh, I forget whether I was seven or in the seventh grade when I started there. So you did and work at the school. Oh, I saw the jerk till I was halfway through my master's degree and had to quit so I could that, write my dissertation and get out of school. <laughs> really? Well, that store, that shop, is certainly well known to a lot of Toledoans. It was, I think, known as Odesky Sweet Shop at one yeah. time. Well, you and, know, that's a lead-in to uh, everybody called it that. I was on the inside. I called it Odesky Sweatshop, but it was a little Odesky different. Odesky Sweatshop. I should have seen that one coming. <laughs> it, no, it was a great place. A lot of people drop in, a lot of people from the hospital. Uh, that hung out there, and what was very interesting was my dad's relationship with the uh, orphanage across the street. Um, I didn't realize, somebody maybe 40 or 50 years later that I ran into in a market research situation told me that my dad was given an allowance to maybe 25 or 30 percent of the kids. Yeah. Over there. After so, all those know, years. You never know what you run into. Yeah. And we used to take penny candy up to their camp up in Michigan. Uh, every summer for, you know, 5, 10, 15 years. Yeah. Well, you were born, as we mentioned, 1937, as the Great Depression was sort of winding down in the late 1930s. Was it a struggle uh, for your parents during that unhappy time for America? Well, I pretty much told you the, the store and the job history. Um, so I, I guess I don't know. I was too young. But uh, in the early 40s, uh, we first lived on Warren Street, pretty close to Bancroft, mm -hmm. and then moved down Warren toward uh, Mashon, where we uh, ended up, and that was our home for many years at 12 Mashon. Interestingly, it was the home Harry Freiburg uh, lived in before he moved to, to the other side of town. And next door was the home that my mother grew up in. She always saw that house and always liked it. So that's how we ended up there many years later. I. I think it was always a struggle for everybody. It was a yeah. tough economic time. Yeah. Uh, the risk of starting a store at that time, even though the store was very modest, basically a confectionery yeah. and a place uh, for ice cream and coffee and hot dogs and kibitz. So you were surrounded by or, happy things, even if it was yeah, tough yeah, economic yeah, times. Yeah, yeah pr pretty much uh, everything was uh, very positive and on the up uh, and up. Yeah, yeah. You had uh, two siblings? One sibling. One sibling. Brother Marvin. Brother Marvin. Um, and was he older or younger than you? Three and a half years younger. Okay. Was there a sibling rivalry there? Um, not so much because we weren't really in school together. I mean, when I got out of high school, he came in. We went to Fulton Grade School, which was an excellent grade school. Uh, uh, Ms. Godfrey uh, was the principal for many, many years, and all the teachers had been there yeah. for a very, very long time. My mother went there in a couple of vans. So it was all very... Uh, very positive, modest sibling rivalry, if any, because I was out of Fulton while my brother was still in the fourth or fifth grade, went to Scott, was out of Scott when he came in as a freshman, was at the University of Toledo when he came there, but I was in graduate school, so not so much. Yeah, there was enough years of separation yes, there. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, right on the right amount. <laughs> Just about perfect. <laughs> Three and a half to four. And you went to elementary school, you say, at? Uh, Fulton School. At Fulton, okay. And uh, we were in the old building. Uh, they've already knocked down the new building. So we were uh, there finally at the end of the eighth grade. They took you on a tour upstairs, and you realized why it was such a fire trap that they better build the next building, which they did. And uh, it was in that s small gymnasium that uh, we both started, uh, well, my brother a little later, but playing basketball. And uh, we knew it was going to be a, a rough routine when... I was supposed to go downtown. The bus station was right across uh, the way from Scott, or from uh, Fulton, rather. And uh, I was supposed to meet my mother downtown at Petrie's and bring my brother along. And I had a chance to try out as a sixth grader for the seventh grade team. So I never made the bus. Uh, I did get a few words of uh, consternation over that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was basically the start of many, many years of... Uh, uh, softball, uh, bowling, uh, basketball, you know, the whole so you routine had a variety of as many interests. kids go through. Yeah, yeah. Were you a good bowler? Um, I carried about 167 average, not bad. I'd say that's but pretty not good. good. No, I've got a grandson now doing a lot better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what uh, you're, you're supposed to brag about your grandson. Oh, okay, so, uh, uh, I will. 
Um, but no, he, uh, we, we were okay. We, I bowled for four years for Scott. Uh, we had a, a reasonably good team. Uh, a good friend who this year will come in as a, a Hall of Fame honoree for uh, Scott, Dr. Haig Kazazian from, uh, in Baltimore now with Johns Hopkins. I had to call him one time on something for a uh, reunion uh, for Scott, and I got one of his kids, and Haig wasn't available, so I gave him a message, and I told her the story of her dad bowling, and she couldn't believe that he ever bowled. <laughs> so it, you never know. told, yeah. <laughs> So you were at Scott for four years. Did you play basketball all four years at Scott? Our freshman year, we took the city championship, uh, and I was a starter then. then I moved well, on the freshman team? Yeah, freshman team. Okay. Sophomore year was so-so. Mm -hmm. Junior and senior, uh, uh, we were very poor. <laughs> what position did you play? A guard. Were you a uh, scorer? No, that, that was my problem. <laughs> I, I, I was a bench warmer pretty much yeah. the last couple of years. I was sixth man, sixth or seventh. That's an and important role. <laughs> there was a guy by the name of uh, Dick Sansbury who was our all city and uh, a, a great ball player, starting guard, moved things along. It was interesting as we matured through the years, uh, he found that my playing at Scott was a lot better than I remembered it to be. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> What else can you tell us about your high school years at Scott, up, apart from your sports and so forth? Are you get, did you get involved in student government? Yeah, um, student activities was a strong piece. Uh, I was the publicity commissioner, uh, where we made the signs for the football games and the basketball games that would hang in the walls. And we had a team of about four or five of us uh, in the art department uh, that did that. Uh, we were involved organizationally. Uh, I remember one time, uh, I think it was my sophomore year or junior year, uh, a Spanish class, and they decided to have a Spanish club, and I got elected president because I was playing basketball at the time, and I wasn't at the meeting. So I learned how to open the meeting, I learned how to close the meeting, and we had the shortest meetings in the history of the school. But um, no, great faculty at Scott, and... Uh, and then, you know, you may get into this later, but I pulled together the 75th and the 100th reunion for Scott, uh, where we had about, I don't know, 1,000, 1,200 at one and eight or 900 at the other. So I had a chance. I've got maybe 25 or 35 yearbooks, including the first one from 1917. That was the first full-time graduating class. Really? The school opened in 1913. Wow. And in looking at it, and they had silhouettes of all the, te uh, all the instructors, and probably 60% of them were still there in 1951 when I got to school. I mean, I walked into a history class one time, and the history teachers, I remember when your mother was standing there. <laughs> so you, you've got a That's lot of something. tradition. Yeah. And that was, uh, ju just to go on for a few other points, that was just the time when the transition of Scott from being disproportionately white to disproportionately minority African-American black took place. And when I was graduated in 55, it was about 55, 45, white to black. When my brother graduated four years later, it had just reversed. 45, white, Good 55, that, black. That span of time. In terms of the demographic mm -hmm. uh, movement, which was pretty, pretty uh, heavy movement. Yeah. And, and, and it was a great opportunity because you had the chance to mix races, people, mm -hmm. um, we were all involved in everything. Yeah. And uh, it was a good time. Yeah. You had a slogan, I'm told. I'm not the researcher you are, but in something I read, uh, you mentioned that there's a slogan you, you uh, used to say, uh, and maybe it was in the Scott High School yearbook, I don't know. <laughs> Life will never grow weary for me. Uh, can you elaborate on that a bit for us? Well, it hasn't, but I don't remember ever that being a quote, but um, now we've taken on things we can do, charges to be involved in the community, to be involved in things um, at varying levels, and uh, have tried never to turn down responsibility, be it from the business setting, being working in my dad's store. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was a, a little kid, and I was in there uh, three nights a week, six to eight o'clock, so we could go home for dinner. I was there on weekends for half a day each day, so he could get a break in things. And when it reversed and we had to be out doing something, then he put in the time. And my brother put in time. So we, we all worked around it. So we didn't let things get too worried when all was said and done. 
Were there ever any expectations placed upon you by your parents in terms of a profession or what to do uh, after school, after high school? No, not at all. Um, college uh, was never a second guess. I uh, was going to do that, and uh, I didn't look uh, too far. I, I, I thought University of Toledo was going to be right because I knew that it was going to be financially difficult all the way around and that I wanted my brother to have the same opportunity. So I wasn't going to go wherever. Uh, plus, I didn't go to uh, the University of Toledo. I went to TU, Toledo University, sponsored at the time by a quarter percent millage from the city of Toledo and worked on the last campaign in 1960, my graduate year, under Jim Bruner, who was the marketing professor, mm -hmm. Dr. Bruner. And he organized all the teachers, all the students. I was in graduate school at the time, the graduate students. So I had a team that met out at Libby, Libby High School. And it rained like the Dickens that day. And I'm sure it was the feel sorry support for all these uh, all wet kids <laughs> that helped move the vote that just, just passed. And then while that was going on or just after, uh, Toledo, Akron, and Cincinnati, called AC, Akron, Cincinnati, Toledo. We went down to the lobby in uh, Columbus. I was president of the student body at the University of Toledo. As a byproduct, my brother was president of the student body at Scott. Mm -hmm. student body at Scott. And the three student body presidents and the presidents of the university, Dr. Carlson, we were all down there. And I knew we were in uh, deep trouble. I wasn't too much into politics at the time. But when the chairman of the committee was from Ohio University in Athens, I knew we were uh, <laughs> probably not going to make it quite that year. But we did, uh, we did soon thereafter, two or These three years later. efforts to get the university state supported. State supported mm -hmm. so that uh, it could continue and it could grow. And when did that finally uh, transition? I think in the, uh, well, we were down there in 60, probably 62 or 63. Uh -huh is when it got its first state aid, all three schools. So the university transitioned from a municipal university right. to state-supported. What, uh, and you were on the student senate while you were at UT, and then you ran for student body president? I, I, I ran on a post for student body president. Um, what they I, knew better than to take on Stan Odesky, right? For, no, 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 no. <laughs> I think they didn't realize that there was a full scholarship available, ah. that if you uh, did that. And the year before, I had been a business manager for the yearbook, the Block House. Uh, which was half scholarship, so those two things helped uh, go through. But yeah, when I, I was president of the student body in 1959, and I thought we did some very interesting things. We changed the alma mater. Well, that's an interesting we story. Started, what happened there? We, well, let me give you a few, and then we can come back to them. We started the Athletic Hall of Fame. We got the chimes going again mm -hmm. and the university in the, in the tower. tower. Yeah. yeah, and there was something else that I forget. The, stor the story on the... Uh, the alma mater? On the alma mater was one of, it was to uh, Cornell's Cuyahoga Waters. Mm -hmm. So everybody could hum it, but they didn't know the words. So we talked to a little committee we put together from student government, talked to the music department, we talked to alumni, we talked to others, and we put together a committee and ran a contest. and had three or four original uh, music and words uh, supplied and selected one of those and introduced it at homecoming in 1959. Now 50 years later I had to call Dan Savig to remind him of that and they brought back, uh, I, I don't know whether the gal was still living at the time, she was an AOPI graduate from the University of Toledo and uh, her husband, one wrote the music and one wrote the words and they had them at the uh, at the session and straightened out what was going on. Yeah. They've still given total credit to the alumni for doing it, but it was actually yeah. the undergraduates that started that When one. that change occurred, was there much uh, pushback from older alumni who didn't want it changed? On the music? or yeah, on the, either one. Uh, or or the, the institution set up. No, I, I don't think so. Um, they probably didn't hear it unless they came to a ball game <laughs> kind of thing. And at that time, our records weren't too hot. Yeah. I mean, it was after I got out that we went on, what, the 30-some game winning streak. Uh, so we were kind of 2-8, and eight, whatever and whatever. But, um, no, I, I don't. 
yeah. recall any pushback. Had you paid for your own college education up to that point until that scholarship came along? Is that something yeah, you were yeah, expected yeah. to help? Yeah, no, no, I, I paid for it out of earnings at the store, and my mm -hmm. dad paid for books. Um, now, keep in mind, it was $90 a semester at the time. Yeah. First semester. Now that might not even buy a textbook. Well, that might not even, that, well, it doesn't, because I've <laughs> taught, uh, I taught the market research course there uh, when uh, a gentleman passed away out on the West Coast and they needed some help. So I got recruited, and the books were 120 bucks. Wow. I just couldn't realize that. It, it, it is amazing. <laughs> uh, did you have a mentor? As a young adult, obviously your parents were well, big well, influence well, upon yeah, you. But yeah, the parents. Um, I, I would think uh, a, a few of the people, the, uh, the fellow in charge of student activities at Scott was there, uh, Watson Welver, Welver, who was the athletic director and my first basketball coach at Fulton was there. So you had that routine. There was an art teacher by the name of, they called him, his name was Cuthbert Ryan, they called him, Ryan, they called him Cussy. And he was the one on the uh, publicity commission and a few art classes that I took. But it was pretty much the mix of seeing leaders. Now, the two athletic and student advisory uh, people, Ralph Miracle and Watson Welliver, played for the Scott High School national champion football teams the one that went out to uh, Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, mm -hmm. and they won, and then the one that played at Detroit. And back in that era, Scott was national high school champion twice. Wade was national champion twice. Wow. Which started some of the rivalry. Now, uh, a few years, let's see, you graduated from the University of Toledo then what, in 1959, 60? In 59, undergraduate, in 60, masters. Okay. And a few years after college, you uh, married uh, the love of your wife, your life, your wife Sheila. Right. Uh, how did the two of you meet? <laughs> she was down visiting her boyfriend in Miami Beach, along with her mother, and I was down there. Uh, I took a wrong turn on my way to Atlanta, Georgia, to a fraternity convention. So my brother and I and one of his teachers drove to Miami to spend a week there before we went they to took convention. took a long turn at, at Atlanta? No, no, we went all the way down to Miami the on the way back to Atlanta to get there. So that was a wrong <laughs> turn. Well, it turned out to be a... <laughs> turned out to be great. Fortunate trip. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. then uh, on our way back from Atlanta to Toledo, it turned out to be about her birthday. So I sent some flowers, you know, in advance. And uh, I guess one of the other fellows, she was going with from time to time, was sitting out front when she got home holding on to my flowers to give to her. <laughs> so we came through uh, Pittsburgh, and then uh, she was enrolled at Penn State. So uh, we went together for about six or, eight, six or eight months, and I proposed, and we were married within the year. Wow. It was too far a trip to Penn State. <laughs> That's great. Now, you've been married, what, 53? 53 years, yeah. We're here, sitting yeah. here in December of 2016, 53 right. years right. of marriage. Right. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, after college and, af and your marriage, you had some new responsibilities. Did you know yet what you wanted to do for a career? <laughs> well, I had written my uh, dissertation on an analysis of the opinions of Toledo residents concerning Toledo, Ohio, 1960, under the tutelage of Dr. Jim Bruner. Um, the same one that put me out in the rain at Libby. Um, and you were able to use the class, the senior class in marketing research, to actually do the field work. So we developed a survey, I developed the survey, uh, you know, with his constructive criticism, and we selected a random sample and had the class go out and actually do the interviewing. We got it tabulated, and uh, actually the person now borrowing and reading it is uh, Dr. Johnson, the former president of the university who knows a lot about Toledo, mm -hmm. uh, just for background information. I think somewhere in your career, I lent it to you, I've lent it to Tom Troy, I've lent it to a lot of people through time, and it's, uh, hmm. uh, th the thing that's interesting, things haven't changed a lot since 1960 in terms of Toledoans' attitudes about Toledo. It's my hometown, I'll listen to all the noise, but I still support it. Is the bottom you line. probably found to be, uh, well, I'll ask you if you have found to be true something I've noted over the years, and that is that people who were born here uh, sometimes are the harshest critics, uh, the lifelong residents. People who come here from somewhere else 
are the biggest cheerleaders. Right. They think it's great, and we don't understand why people are not more positive. Do you find that to be the case? To some extent, but what I found is all these old-time Toledoans will support it when you talk. It's when they talk among themselves, they might be negative. I find that when they go outside, it's a little more positive circle than that. Circle the wagons kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, circle it's... the wagons kind of thing. And uh, mostly people want things to happen on the good side, I find. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, how much, uh, I want to get into the political polling stuff a bit, both uh, pre-polling and, and analyst, analysis after the fact. Uh, how much of political polling, whether it's for a race between candidates or perhaps for a tax levy, how much of that polling is based on science and how much, particularly in a local race here in Toledo, is based on kind of a gut feeling, seat of the pants, if you will? Well, I don't know how others do it. We always follow traditional, and still do, traditional market research approach. Select a random sample, don't, make, don't be judgmental, um, talk to the people on the phone in our case. Um, and we found we've got pretty straightforward responses. It's getting a little more difficult to get people on the phone now than when we were first there. As people have gone toward online, uh, yeah. mail, and so on, I find that that doesn't work. It's too. Sample-wise, there's too much conjecture. I mean, not too many years ago, uh, Jerry Anderson asked me to come on his show. He had received two polls at about the same time. That we're showing a four or five different spread on, I think, the pre previous presidential election, the Obama uh, second uh, go-around. And he was wondering why. And when I got into the, the only place to find it is the technical analysis, how they did it. Uh, they were having difficulty getting interviews with minority. They were having difficulty with some other subgroups. Uh, one was Republican-based, one was Democratic-based, and they made different judgment calls on how to weight the data. And by weighting the data, they were impacting the results. Mm -hmm. So technically, uh, at least locally, we've tried with everybody to be pure even to the extent that we've turned down business yeah, I would if think, they were trying to force you in some direction. Uh -huh. I would think that people would give a different response if you and I are talking on the phone, for right. example, and you need an answer right now than if they're sitting at a computer keyboard and they've got all afternoon to sure. ponder it. Well, th that's true in terms of top of mind. But keep in mind, the, the market research came out of the uh, sociology professors, uh, and they're the ones that kept things technically correct to be making judgments, then the market research business built up. I mean, I've been in it for 55 or 60 years, and it didn't start much before me. Uh, Howard Trumbull, when he started National Family Opinion locally, started a mail panel, M-A-I-L, mm -hmm. and that was different because that was a quota sample, not a probability sample. And I ended up being an R&D guy there, and my job was to convince people like General Mills, General Foods, Procter & Gamble, they've been doing it this way forever, going house to house. Now they couldn't get the cooperation, they were getting doors slammed on. Why was this other stuff successful? So we replicated what they did by mail and found your marketing decision wouldn't be any different. So we were able, we were doing 3,000 studies a year for the major manufacturers across the country. Yeah. Now, politically, locally, just to get back to that for you, <coughs> those have always been probability samples of the only decision we've made is registered voters in an election similar to the one we're covering. So, for instance, we take out presidential in non-presidential years because you get an extra 10 or 15 percent that show up that uh, vote differently. But one of the reasons most of the levies now go in presidential is some of our advice, uh, our advice because many of those people vote positive. So you can pick them up that one time. And that's why this year, when there are, what, five or six countywide levies, I was nervous about any of them. How important is the question, the way it's phrased, the way it's asked? Can, is it possible for a pollster unintentionally to uh, sway a result by the way, the question's sure, asked. Sure, um, or intentionally. 
or intentional. Um, and there's a lot of research on that and how to get around it. But you've got to be careful. Uh, we try to be as neutral as we can possibly be and not push it in one direction or the other. We might take a series of statements, for instance, on a levy uh, and have an agree-disagree five-point scale. Do you strongly agree, somewhat agree, neither agree nor disagree, and so on? And that way we can phrase it any way you want, and they can either be for it or against it. Right. So That's we try and get around it then. way than just yes or no. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, also on candidates, you've got to make sure to rotate the name. If you're going to ask uh, Smith versus Jones, you better have an equal time of doing Jones versus Smith. So every other interview goes the other way. And that's pre-marked on the questionnaire and done in all the things we do. So you've got to be careful. There's some guidelines. Uh, and public enemy number one for a pollster has to be influencing the outcome or the answer uh, in the manner you, you know, you, whether intentional, you don't want to do it intentionally if you can help it, but uh, giving them a, an option. In fact, I've been involved in polls where they said on a scale of one to 10. Right. And that's getting back to what you're talking right. about. Right. You can sign a number and. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we have a lead in question that we use on name recognition. I'm going to read you a list of possible candidates for something. Uh, for each one, uh, please rank them on how well you like them from 1 to 10, 10 being the, uh, the highest, or tell us that you don't know them. And that gives us two very interesting bits of information. It gives you the number who don't know a candidate. So if you got somebody down to 23 percent um, versus somebody who's 80, you know that situation from the research. And then you get a scale uh, from whatever to whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, mo most of the people are ranked pretty well. There's a, there's a couple on an ongoing basis that are continually at the bottom, and you'd love their names, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I won't pressure you for those. Uh, what's more important for a poll's accuracy, uh, a large sample or a quality sample? In other words, if you've got 1,000 people just going down the phone book, or if you've got 100 but you know their past history. I mean, which, which do you think would be more effective? It depends on what your research goal is. If you want a probability sample, then you, for instance, from the thousand, you can either throw the numbers all in a barrel, or what you usually do is take a stratified random where you take a number in your thousand example from one to 10, Now I flip pages and take the last number of what shows up. So let's say it's nine. So I take number nine, number 19, number 29, and so on. Yeah, my, I don't want to influence the sample. Right. Now, sometimes if you've done a pre-study to see how things look, and then you're going to do a post-study, statistically you can get by with a smaller sample by repeating among the same people to see if they've changed opinions on anything. So again, it depends on the goal. Have you ever had a, a survey, a sample, where... Early on, it's evident you're getting an unexpected trend, perhaps. Uh, the Democratic candidate that's high, heavily favored isn't faring so well. Does that happen a lot? And does that tell you ahead of time maybe the, the Democrats in trouble? I don't get to look at it ahead of time. I wait to see the results cut at 150 or 300. So I've got all the data in front of me. Because we know in the interviewing process, and I, the one thing we wait, or no, we don't wait, but we manage, and I get in trouble every time I say this, is women tend to pick up the phone at a higher proportion than men. So we have to balance that out. So after a while, we're monitoring to make sure that always stays within a 45-55 ratio. And if it gets outside of that, then we got to ask, is there a male we can speak to, to try and balance it? Well, that's about the only place we work the numbers. Do you notice any difference in gender uh with regard to reluctance to share their feelings with you? Uh, no, women? no, and what's really fun is every once in a while, when one's answering, the other one gets on the phone and says, I didn't tell you that, or you, you know, you get some cross conversation <laughs> of, going between mom and dad the because yeah. they want to know what's going on, uh, who's calling me and why. But, um, no, I, I mean, obviously the opinions are different by gender, by age, by where they live. I mean, a phenomenon here is the city of Toledo versus the suburbs right. in terms of what goes on and the areas of the city. I mean, one of the things on the prediction side of things 
what we used to do on air is we would look at precincts. That was absolutely different than the telephone interviewing. We looked at, at, at the time when we first got started in the early 1960s for the first, well, the first time we did it was Ned Skelton against John Potter mm -hmm. for the first direct mayoral. And the question was, should we stay in party or should we get out of there? So I selected precincts uh, based on uh, the combined vote being representative of the total vote and selected 36 precincts, or 40 that made up Toledo at the time, and then said, okay, well, if you can't get 40, get 20 every other one. If you can't get those, get 10. <coughs> they got 10, and uh, they went home early. Uh, we're showing a big Potter victory. And, uh, but on city council, one of them didn't make any sense. It was like, at that time we were projecting the actual vote count. It was off 10,000, and I couldn't figure that out. I think I know which one you're talking about. Was it? No, not the Andy Douglas one. Uh, I was going to ask that you about that. That came up later. This was Bob Savage. Okay. And Bob Savage's vote was about 10,000 less than what was predicted. And when I went back and I looked at the data, I found out that his brother had made a mathematical error of 100, and based on multiplying it out, it cost him 10,000 votes. Oh, my goodness. So, uh, so we modified that the next time around uh, when... Bob or somebody leaked the fact that we had done this kind of predicting and that we were pretty much on to Dave Drury at TV 13 who called me mm -hmm. and asked if I wanted to go on. And <laughs> without knowing what I was doing, I said, sure. And uh, we put together a team and we did it. And that was the time that uh, Sal Wittenberg beats Andy Douglas 50.5 to 49.5. No way in the world the system is that sensitive at that time. So a after that, we eventually also did this in Buffalo. And they were smarter than they were. And if it was too close, they called it TCTC, too close to call. So we used that approach afterwards. <laughs> uh, you, you always learn something in the system. Was that the, <coughs> the election where Andy initially appeared to have lost? Uh, no, that was a later one. That was later. That and was a later and one. That also caught everybody by surprise. Well, that It caught, was corrected, but. Well, that caught everybody but, by surprise but us. We had Andy Douglas in the top eight for council because we went to the precinct. That, that whole system, let me give you two seconds on how it works. Yeah. We selected the precincts at uh, every tenth one. Okay, then we made sure they were within a half a percent, the total vote, of a previous similar election. If not, we modified by one going in one direction or the other. Uh -huh. So we ended up, we always had precincts within a half a percent of a previous election. And then we had a team from a drug and bu bugle corps, parents, that went out to the precincts and they copied the vote. By law in Ohio, you post the vote at the precinct before you take it downtown. So quite honestly, we weren't any smarter than anybody else. We just had the vote an hour earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the system. And if it got too tight, then uh, we call it TCTC, but if it went in the direction we had said, we took credit for it. Bottom line, we ended up with correct 396 out of 400 elections that we covered over that time yeah, span. Yeah, that's quite an impressive so, record. Yeah. Well, you've done polling for the uh, Port Authority, uh, the Regional Growth Partnership, the Toledo Lucas County Public Library, uh, TARDA, the list goes on. The list goes on. Uh, is it possible, I'm going to embarrass you here a little bit, that you may know more about the workings of government in Lucas County than any other individual? Oh, absolutely not. Mike Beasley knows more. <laughs> <laughs> At least Mike Beasley thinks so, doesn't he? Um, I'm really not behind the scenes. I know very little of what goes on there. We help them out. Uh, we work on the levy. They're on every, what, two, three, four years. So there's nothing in between. So, uh, no, I think we knew more about it when we were doing tracking of attitudes toward police, fire, mm -hmm. and uh, garbage pickup for Donna Owens with, uh, when she was mayor, uh, we would periodically, quarterly, bring a team of uh, people that worked for the city to City Hall and you'd see the lights on on two floors in the evening. And we had pre-selected a sample and they did the interviewing. 
so we, they could keep costs down for the city. And there we had a chance to monitor overall attitudes toward government, how things were going. Yeah. Speaking of attitudes toward <clears throat> government, you, didn't you also conduct a study regarding the uh, possible reform of Lucas County government? Well, uh, I was on the, uh, what's, what, what is the group that? Uh, CEG? CEG kind of thing. I was on one where we talked to you earlier on TV with the uh, convention hall, and then we were on one for uh, city government, or county government, the, the merger of the two. Yeah. That's what that one was all about. MetroGov, I think Met, they call um, it. Something like Unigov. Could, could, Unigov, uh, yeah. three or four cities, uh, Louisville, uh, Akron, yeah. Indianapolis. I mean, it's basically the Indianapolis model where they had been so successful. Yeah. Um, and we interviewed everybody but the kitchen sink um, and, and had a... Uh, a lot of information and a lot of good people on that committee who uh, tried to move ahead. Uh, we got it to a vote, unsuccessful. And uh, I, I hope at some point in time that gets around. The, the, only, the only problem, if you look at Cleveland and if you look at Akron, I don't know that much about uh, Louisville or Indianapolis on it, but it took major disasters for the county and the city for things to happen, people stealing, all kinds of crazy things. Yeah. You don't well, want that here to get to that well, kind of government. Well, you get a situation here, of course, where you've got a, uh, a city, a core city, where a population is moving out. Uh, right. Population numbers continue to decline in the core city, but the suburbs get bigger right. and, and well off. Yeah, so well, it's been and there are of, natural boundaries there. Well, it's been kind of a balancing act. I mean, Toledo went so. down from 350 to just under 300,000. Uh, the county was what four fifty five hundred, and stayed about the same yeah. uh, kind of thing. And now we're seeing people on a little further ridge uh, moving out. It's um, it's going to be difficult to get through because the same way with school districts. I mean, we've got what eight or ten, you know, in the uh, in the county and in the nearby area, and there's got to be just all kinds of duplication that one could save money, but nobody wants the other guy's problems. And that that, seems that's always to be a the problem issue. with the yes. school districts. That you've got people who no longer have children in the schools, right. and so why should I have to pay for the education? Forgetting that their kids were right. education exactly. paid for by those who came earlier. See, and, and it's interesting that on that very specific piece, the schools have not been able to continue to drum that home. And I find that very frequently they just look at parents, and they can't even be assured of the parent vote when all is said and done from looking at it. TARDA, on the other hand, has done a good job in selling the need for traffic, for bus service for those that don't have cars. Mm -hmm. And it would be interesting to see schools take on some of that persona. Yeah. Didn't you also get involved in uh, the pre-planning for the new uh, arena downtown? Uh, where should it go? Uh, that kind of thing. Should it be downtown? Should it be back on the east side where the old one was? Were you involved in that process? You know, I don't recall. We may have done a general survey, okay. you know, on that. Um, but, but, but again, as a byproduct, I keep giving you byproducts here. Yeah. Um, only about a third of the people, even with Mud Hen Stadium there, uh, have been in downtown Toledo in the last three years. As of two or three years ago, that was a, a, a question that was fed into something. So we think that all this stuff is going on. And they're doing a great job down there, but we're still not attracting people. When we, Toledo is one of the first areas to go into malls. Uh, Southgate being one of the early ones. And we've trained people not to put a nickel in for uh, uh, their car and, and everything else. And the, they get all these things outside the city. So downtown has become pretty much a business government center. Now we'll see whether this ProMedica thing helps turn it around with the numbers they're bringing down, and I hope they do. Well, you're right. Malls all, be, all became kind of the town center. Exactly. Uh, instead of the center of town. Exactly. Well, that's a good way uh, to put it. Did you find yourself getting disappointed over the years by what most people would say were low election turnouts? I mean, it, sometimes it seems absurd that, you know, such a small fraction of all those who could have decided an issue actually did. I'm not disappointed. I'm totally frustrated 
and irritated that it continues to go in that direction. We gave the young people a vote. They never used it mm -hmm. in all reality. I mean, the percent of the youth that vote is ridiculous. Uh, the minority population, I've been trying to get groups within the black community to take on responsibility for get out the vote efforts uh, for years, and I can't find anybody uh, willing to take on the task. I mean, e even this year it was clear that the vote was, what, 10, 15 percent under uh, what Obama was able to get out for president. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just a shame. We don't, we don't seem to have that same respect for the for the voting process and I, I'm sure when you were growing up certainly true when I was growing up I viewed it as an obligation exactly and I don't sense that anymore I agree that that's the case you mentioned uh, this year's 2016 election uh, and America has elected a new president so I've got to ask you uh, you've been in the business of political projections for a long time forecasting did you see Donald Trump's victory over Hillary Clinton coming? Absolutely not. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't see that she would do less good in the major metropolitan areas, and he would do a little better in each of the counties. When you look at the county analysis, there's about 3,300 counties in the United States. Clinton might have gotten about, what, give her the benefit of four or 500 to make up major metropolitan areas. So you got 2,800 out there that yeah. he did a little better in each uh, on the Trump side. So I, I think a lot of it was right there. I think the impact of the minority vote uh, not being as strong. Uh, and obviously Trump hit some hot buttons that nobody suspected. But no, I didn't see it coming at all. Mm -hmm. uh, in retrospect, uh, if you get a chance to analyze all the numbers and everything, and you mentioned a few cases here where she did poorer than you had anticipated, than any of it had anticipated. Um, do you think we've seen the last of her in American politics? <laughs> I don't think you've seen the last of anybody in American politics. Sometimes it's tough to walk away. It, it, uh, yeah. it, it is. Uh, I mean, you're probably a better judge of that than I am, but I, I've never seen anybody that, uh, once they were elected and had the responsibility or were appointed, has found it easy to turn away. Exactly. Uh, in that regard, given your lifelong interest in uh, politics and public policy, did you ever consider running for public <laughs> office? Yeah, but luckily, uh, no, I never really did. But uh, Or luckily, you, you, as you were about to say, uh, they talked you out of no, it. No, 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 no. Uh, the story is I moved to New York for five years, 67 to 72. Okay. And in 1967, uh, Howard Cook, or somewhere just earlier than that, decided to run for... Uh, state senate and so there was going to be an opening on council and somebody wanted to test the use of the political name in toledo and they came up with somebody who uh, i had to kick out of a statistics class for cribbing and i wouldn't use that name so i said well gee there was a guy out at the university when i was there played basketball baseball football wrestled by the name of gene cook uh, let me toss his name in and let's see what happens Gene comes in ninth after the first eight in, uh, on the list that were, that were the current council. So I set up a luncheon with he and uh, Boyle and uh, Mort Knipe. Um, and we sat down uh, for lunch. And Mort said, Stan, we would like you to. I said, Mort, I'm uh, leaving for New York tomorrow. I took a promotion at NFO, and I'm going to head up the East Coast kind of thing. He said, well, gee, we want you to run for city council. I said, well, here's Gene. <laughs> and that's how Gene got involved in politics. And, of course, he went on to become well, one of the most popular vote getters he, of he, all time. He, he was great. He, what, for 30 years, many of those as vice mayor. That led to, uh, well, I'm sure other things led to it, the involvement with the mud hens, mm -hmm. you know, and all that activity. And, and when I'd get back in town or I would spot him at dinner, somebody would come over and put a headlock on me, Odeski, you. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. You're the one that got me involved in it, and he loved it, as you yeah. know he loved it. Yeah, I'm sure he wasn't upset with <laughs> no, you at all. At all. Uh, you and your wife have been fans of the uh, Toledo Lucas County Public Library uh, uh, for many years, and you serve the library. Why is that so important, do you think? Well, being a Kent Library kid, um, mm -hmm. it, go it goes back at least for us, for to me, for high school. My wife came from Pittsburgh, so... Uh, 
it was just the opportunity. We're, we're both uh, major readers, uh, always have a book in hand. I mean, I probably go through two or three books a week. My wife is the selector for me. Um, but we just think that's an important community endeavor. I mean, all the things, especially in this library, the way it has been sensitive to the public, the way it's attempted to move out into regions of the city um, to offer uh, activities. I, I, mean, I mean, you can come here and uh, take care of passport type things. I, I mean, it's just all over. Whatever you want is here. And it's, it's great to see the smile on kids' faces as they come in. Uh, we just recently took a tour of the new one out in Sylvania. Uh, and, you know, it's just phenomenal just to see people's faces light up on how important it is. Uh, but you can, just as a byproduct, you can never get the director, Clyde Scholes, to leave an election night early. We were out in Maumee one time 20 years ago, and that was when uh, Donna Owens was still running for mayor second time round or whatever, and I had the vote from that precinct, or not from that precinct, the first precinct called in, plus I had the pass vote for both of those kinds of elections, and on one precinct, I told Clyde he could go home or open up the champagne, they were a winner, because both Donna was ahead of what she had in the same precinct, as was he, he wouldn't go home. And I couldn't even get them to go home on the last election. They were way ahead. Wanted to be absolutely <laughs> absolutely sure. Absolutely sure. <laughs> I'm not surprised. That sounds like it. Yeah. Uh, Stan, you've also been very involved uh, in your Jewish faith. Uh, you served as president of the Jewish Community Center uh, several years ago. Your faith is very important to you, isn't it? Clearly. Um, we, at one time, I was a member of all three synagogues in town when my kids were going through uh, the Sunday school, the Hebrew school. Process, but no, for both my wife and myself, um, we try to attend services as frequently as we can for quite a while. We were making just about every Friday night uh, we were in town. Um, but yeah, and and levels of involvement, you know, have differed. But we've supported everything we can support. I mean, I mean, my wife has been president of four or five organizations. I've been president of four or five organizations. Yeah. We both have the philosophy that whatever they are, you attend everything you, that is out there. Yeah. In other words, you, you can't lead it and not support it. And we feel the same way in terms yeah. of religious yeah. activity. Uh, you and Sheila had uh, two daughters, is that right? Could, tell us about the daughters. Well, Bonnie is here, and she's taken over my business. Uh, has two children. Uh, Seth, who is a sophomore at Cincinnati, just back in Toledo for uh, uh, midterm. And... Uh, my granddaughter, the queen, uh, Rebecca, is uh, working for Dick's Sporting Goods. She's a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh and uh, graduated on Sunday and started work on Monday for them over in the, uh, the corporate fortunate. headquarters of south of Pittsburgh. Uh, and then in uh, Milwaukee, uh, my daughter Cheryl, who went to Wisconsin, uh, has three boys, uh, one who is a junior at... Uh, Wisconsin, and we'll be going to uh, France uh, for the second semester this year. Uh, her middle son, Jeremy, was the state diving champion as a senior in high school for Wisconsin, and they got a scholar partial scholarship to Minnesota, and is diving for them, and as a freshman, doing reasonably well. We saw him in a, uh, a diving meet in uh, Indianapolis a couple weeks oh. ago that had the silver medalist diver. And another from Purdue, and another. Now, where did Olympian. that come from? Are you uh, a swimmer, a diver in your I, youth? Uh, actually, in my youth, I'm probably the only one at Scott High School that didn't take swimming. You had to get there <laughs> to graduate, right? But I had a hay fever so bad they wouldn't let me in. So it's clearly not me. Now, actually, he was a gymnast uh, through the uh, eighth grade, and then uh, the high school that he goes to, Nicolay. Uh, didn't offer gymnastics, so he was looking for something to do. So he took on diving. Yeah. So that was the extent of his diving training till he got there, and then he moved up through the four years. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know anything about it. Uh, in gym, in one you go this way, and one you go this <laughs> way. I mean, I figured the gymnastics help up on the high diving board when you're on the end there, holding on for dear life before you do whatever you're doing. But he he's a natural. Yeah. He's a natural. And then the youngest who is 110 pounds and about six foot. Uh, so we've gone through a couple of collapsed lungs there. Uh, but thank goodness he's fine. He's our bowler. 
and played some volleyball as a freshman now with Nickel Wing. I'm guessing uh, as a grandfather, like most grandfathers, you don't get to see them nearly as much as you'd like. That's absolutely true. Uh, especially the ones in Wisconsin. Well, that was a nice thing about this Thanksgiving. Uh, for the first time in a couple of years, all five grandkids were together here. So we did have the opportunity. So it was a big picture time. <laughs> I would think so. Um, and uh, a, gr a great opportunity. And, you know, as a proud grandfather, they're all great kids. Uh -huh. They really are. You've uh, watched a lot of veteran public servants over the years. Who are the two or three that stand out in your mind as most remarkable for whatever reason? Are you talking just locally or yeah. go beyond that? I could throw a few names out, but then I'd be guilty of doing no, what no, pollsters yeah. well, are supposed to do. Well, you don't want to do that on interviewing and create a biased <laughs> situation if you do rotate the names uh, <laughs> for it. <laughs> um, actually, uh, I appreciated the efforts of people like Ned Skelton, who never gave up, got into a lot of things. I mean, you remember him swinging across the Muddy Maumee? Or swimming across? He had said, what, in five Dr years? Drinking like uh, Yeah, well, whatever it was going to be, he was going to straighten it out. Uh, baseball, we can really give him some credit for. Mm -hmm. And i got to tell you my uh, Marlon Stewart story. I mentioned it earlier. Marlon Stewart pitched for the Mud Hens at one point in time that went on to St. Louis. And uh, we lived at the corner of Franklin and Mashon, and to get to Mud Hen Stadium was a reasonable walk. But I told my mother I was going to go to the game, and if tickets were uh, over a dollar ten, or no, a dollar and a quarter, because I thought they were a dollar ten, I'd come home. I got out there, and they were a buck and a quarter, when I really thought they were ninety cents. So I turned around and walked home. <laughs> Marlon Stewart pitched a no hitter that night. Oh my God! So for a lack of thirty five, <laughs> for, for, for and I had the thirty five cents. <laughs> <laughs> but you weren't going to pay those prices. Uh, no, I had told my mother if it was above, I wasn't going. I'll so be honest. You missed a no hitter. I missed a no hitter. <laughs> Only time in history I came close. Let's see, other uh, <clears throat> politicians. Um, I thought that Donna did a good job. Donna Owens. Donna you know, as mayor. Um, of course, you know, this one's a little biased because I went to college, he ran my campaign for president of the student body, blah, blah, blah. Bob Savage and I have been friends for years. And Bob has been behind the scenes in recent years. But at one time as a young man, he was vice mayor. Yes, You know, of Toledo. I covered City Hall when he was oh, vice mayor. Okay, yeah. okay. And uh, Bob and I, uh, <laughs> when we came back from New York in 72, I get a, a phone call to go on the opera board, and the phone call is, Bob, uh, have you ever been to the opera? I said, no, I went to the ballet once. He said, good enough, you're on the board. Close enough. You know, close <laughs> enough. And uh, a couple years later, became president of it. So that was an interesting experience. Yeah. But those would be the two or three I would yeah. uh, suggest. You also uh, <clears throat> volunteered for years at the LPGA's Marathon Golf Classic, uh, once known as the Jamie Farr, of course. How did you serve the tournament? What were your responsibilities out there? Well, as you might expect, scoring control for the first 10 years. <laughs> counting uh, the votes. Counting huh? the votes. Um, but, but basically, Judd needed some people when he brought back to Glengarry, where I was a member, uh -huh. uh, where it was held for the first five or six years. So I took on scoring control for him. And then after a number of years of doing that, it started out, by the way, in the boys' bathroom on the back end, which was good for half the day until people had too much beer in them, then we had some issues. Um, the, uh, but then I went on and headed up a couple of the uh, fundraising events, and then the one that got to me eventually was the parking lot, uh, being outside too much. So then I went inside, and we now work with the media for the last 10 or 15 So years. I'm guessing you established a relationship with Jamie Farr. Uh, over we did, the years. or I did, absolutely. Great Toledo one. Great Toledo one, and he sat uh, in that chair. Did he, oh yeah, well I, I looked up all that you did, and I, <laughs> like I said, I found that I knew 80, 85 percent of them. Actually, and maybe we can use this as kickoff for it, or you can figure out a way to do it. Uh, Don, who was one of the chairman of the event, and and I talked about find, finding a museum for a Jamie Farm Museum and setting it up in Toledo. And at the time that I talked to him about it, and Donna was in on that, Donna Owens, and uh, he had a bunch of stuff still downstairs at his home. Now, that's five, six, eight years ago. And we couldn't find a place. I called uh, Joe Napoli uh, with Hensville, whether they had any space yeah. there, we might be able to do it. 
but uh, I thought that would be a great opportunity for the city. I mean, you could actually do it that as the permanent, and then you could rate. That's a marvelous idea. Uh, Teresa it's, Brewer it's and others. Go, yeah, you know, it's not going anywhere right now. As right, far as right now it's uh, sitting idle. We did have it to the point yeah. that if we had a had it on rollers in some way, you know. we could bring some stuff into Seagate. Yeah, a lot of towns um, do that for their favorite sons and daughters. Well, Lucille Ball. Well, that, that's where the idea came from. Yeah. We happened to go through Erie uh -huh. uh, on a trip, and we stopped at the Lucille Ball uh, home or homestead. I don't know yeah. where that was really where she, And we liked the bakery across the street, too, where she first. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you a golfer yourself? Um, I got down. You don't to, have to be good at it. Uh, well, no, clearly not good. I got down to 14 handicap. I'm probably closer now to 25 or 30. My number was a little higher <laughs> than <it>? that. <laughs> um, you're, as we sit here in 2016 and, and wind down our conversation, you're what 79 years old. You seem to have the energy of somebody 20 years younger. Some days I feel that way. Some days I don't. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel today? Is that one of the days? Yeah. Today's, Today's a good day. Great, great. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking back to that quote from your high school days that uh, life will never grow weary for you. Life has been an adventure for you, hasn't it? Well, it's been a good adventure. I mean, we've, we've missed a lot of stuff in the discussion uh, because we've, we've kept it local, which is good. But, um, you know, I ended up at uh, some, some very interesting things for, uh, what, Product Safety Commission hearing in Washington, testifying a couple times based on research we did at NFO. Uh, I got recruited one time to discuss sample as we did for a gay and lesbian panel out of uh, Chicago and the way that they recruited members and I was going against the the fellow from Spiegel catalog um, and in fact I had lunch with Marcy Captor uh, at the Capitol building that day and then I was supposed to do this at night but uh, they did such a poor job explaining it that they didn't need me which was fine. Um, so you do get into a variety of different things. Yeah. I've had a chance uh, to meet a lot of political people. Yeah. Um, most recently, the vice president here uh, for it. So yeah, it's uh, it's been a long and positive ride. As you look back on your 79 years, are there any regrets? Well, I would have liked to have seen the not not really, but I'd like to have seen the Jamie Farr thing. I mean, I, I keep looking for opportunities for Toledo and pass the ideas on. I, I guess I yeah. can get behind him and push further. I mean, I thought a walk of fame down along the river sure. with uh, Jamie and Teresa and Mike DeSalle and whatever would be interesting. Yeah. I thought that when they had the uh, trolley uh, for the uh, for Tarda, uh, I would have liked to have seen uh, a trip around famous Toledoans' homes mm -hmm. kind of thing. And it just happened not too long thereafter. The Blade had a feature on Sunday of uh, showing where Mike DeSalle lived, where Teresa Brewer right. lived, right. whatever. And I thought that would be a great opportunity uh, for a, a PR kind of thing. But most of them are, are to build or new ideas to keep organizations going. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, uh, although it's way too early to talk about your legacy, you got a long way to go. Uh, but I think I, I'm getting what you would say, that Toledo, uh, benefited from your help, that there are things still undone that you'd like to see, and you just mentioned a few of them. Well, Seems to know. me that's a pretty good well, legacy. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't know how much it benefited, but I uh, clearly have tried to keep a finger in the pie and, uh, quote, I'm strong for Toledo and always have been. I mean, you ask anybody about conversations and things mm -hmm. and keep looking for new things that get done, uh, be it at the museum, be it at Seagate. I, I, I mean, you know that with Seagate, with the baseball field, and with Huntington, we're one of two cities in the United States, Omaha being the other. So those are all in walking distance. So there's probably a lot of opportunities, and I see it going on now with Hensville and some of the other thoughts. Yeah. Now that's using county money. I, I would prefer it to be private money to make the stuff happen mm -hmm. just as a citizen, but uh, fact at is, least it's getting done. Yeah, it had to happen and yeah, it did yeah, happen. Yeah, and exactly. and you're right, downtown is a remarkable place. Right. And a lot of folks still need to discover it. Yes. Uh, well, Stan, uh, time is precious and we're very grateful to you right. for yours today. Thank you. And uh, appreciate that. Good health, continue good health to you. And we appreciate your interest as well in the Sight and Sound Video History Series of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. Remember, keep reading 
and keep learning.